Amen. Well, thank you, Miss Erica, for that special song. Mary knew. Mary knew who Jesus was. She knew. Some other people knew, too. It's great to have you here. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. And I know that the, this passage of Scripture is familiar to many of us. But you know what I wish? I wish every passage of Scripture was familiar with us. I wish we knew them all. And I wish we treasured every one of them and never grow old of hearing about them. But what we, we don't need a new word from God. What we need is a new commitment to obey the word we have. A new commitment to live for the Lord. Well, as we read in, second, or in uh, the second chapter of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, we're going to read the Christmas story. And I'm not going to read the whole passage uh, because of time, but I'm going to read the first uh, seven verses, and we're going to go from there. And uh, I, I like, I think on Christmas morning when people get up to open gifts instead of just ripping into things, I think Christians ought to have a time. We, we have, you don't have to do everything the way our family does it, but we have had a custom where we would sit down before the started ripping presents open, and we'd read Luke chapter 2 and, and have Jesus fresh on our mind. And uh, this is his birthday. And you say, well, I don't believe he was born in December. Okay, then you believe whenever you want to, but let's just celebrate it. <laughs> whenever it was. I don't know when he was born either. And the rest of those nuts who claim they do don't know either. <laughs> so I'm just going to celebrate it now while everybody else is. I don't want to I get considered to be a nut most of the time anyway, and I don't want to be any nuttier than I am now. <laughs> Luke chapter 2, verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made in, when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Watch this. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in this time that we look into your precious word and talk about the precious birth of your precious son. And Lord, I pray that each of us in this room would give full reverence and full attention to the word of God and the thought of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ who was born to die to pay for our sins. I pray that you'd bless us this morning and may Jesus be fresh on our minds and in our intentions and in our plans. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to preach on the subject, Is there room for Jesus this Christmas? Is there room for Jesus this Christmas? Christmas. Now Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So why did he come? He came that we might have it have life. And he came that we might have it more abundantly. And uh, <laughs> you know, Christmas sometimes rather than drawing us closer to the Lord, rather than drawing us closer to the Lord, sometimes Christmas pushes us away <laughs> from the Lord. And, uh, you know, people are running here and there, and they're like your pastor, sometimes wait till uh, just before closing time on Christmas Eve to do any shopping. I like to give the other shoppers a sporting chance. And, uh, 
And, and, and we go in and, hey, listen, it might be more civil in there on Christmas Eve than you think. Uh, if, you go, uh, if you go a month before Christmas, you'll find that it's pretty hectic. And people are running down those aisles and they're bumping into each other and shoving each other and snatching things off the shelves. And, and people are shopping from daylight till midnight and, and their nerves are frazzled and their feet are hurting. And... Uh, uh, no wonder maybe that little girl when she was praying the Lord's Prayer and got confused she said uh, for, instead of saying forgive us our trespasses she said forgive us our Christmases and uh, you know I think maybe sometimes we need to ask the Lord to forgive us our Christmases hello <laughs> because the way we celebrate them and uh, <laughs> you know I want us to think today about the songs that we sing about Jesus being in a manger, let's think about that particular time in the fleshly life, the carnal life, the life that Jesus was born in the flesh. And let's think about it today. And I want to show you three things this morning that I think will be a blessing to you. Three things to consider about this birth in the end. Let, let me read that last part of verse 7 again. Because there was no room for them in the inn. I want to just say that in that day there was no room for Jesus in the inn and in his life there was no room for him in most of the places where he went and even today there's not much room for Jesus. Notice the first point in my outline. There's no room for the Lord Jesus that first Christmas. There was no room for Jesus in that first Christmas. And uh, that's a true statement. And since, there, since that time, there has been very little room for him anywhere. And I think of the Lord Jesus as he came down from the ivory palaces and he came from, from the portals of heaven to be born through the portals of a virgin's womb. And Jesus was born uh, from that heavenly glorious city on a place on earth that smelled of cow dung. He was born in a stable. He was born in a manger. What's a manger? We have a, a depiction of one right up here on the stage. And a manger is basically a feed trough. And uh, there was no room for him in the inn. And uh, he left the presence of angels to come down and be among men who would despise him. From the Father's house of glory to a feeding trough. I'm talking about the God of heaven. He left heaven from the palaces of heaven and came to a hay-covered, manure-stained stable. Laid in straw. I wonder what the first sensation was like to that little baby. The first thing he felt was the sting of straw against his tender skin. The first greeting to his baby eyes were the sights of a dark and dingy stable. The first thing that his ears heard as a human was the munching of cattle in a barn. The first odor that he smelled was that of the off-scouring of animals. We're talking about our Lord Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who left heaven and came to a stable. Well, first, the first presentation that he had of earth was not all that impressive. <laughs> Rough swaddling clothes, and the Bible records that there was no room for him on top of everything else there was no room for him in the inn. And never, the world never has had much room for Jesus. In Isaiah 53, you remember that prophetic passage in the Old Testament? That prophetic passage says, here, listen to it, it says about Jesus, he is despised and rejected of men. <laughs> yeah. Don't think for a moment that the world has changed. Oh, you say, but preacher, everybody loves the little baby in the manger. Oh, no, they don't. And uh, by the way, when they find out that he died on the cross for him, they like it even less. Now, why was there no room for Jesus in that inn that day? I want to suggest maybe three things. The reason there wasn't 
room for Jesus in the end. First of all, uh, we'll list ignorance as one of the possibilities. Ignorance. Now, that we don't mean that the innkeeper was stupid, but he didn't know who Jesus was. Ignorance. He was unaware of who had just come. Here's a woman who has come, who is, the Bible has said is great with child. She's about to have a baby, and it's obvious. But this innkeeper doesn't know. And you say, well, okay, then. Since he didn't know, he's not to be blamed. <laughs> uh, ignorance is never innocence. <laughs> and there were some people who knew. The innkeeper didn't know, but there were some people who knew. As Erica sang just a few minutes ago, Mary knew. Joseph knew. The shepherds knew. Anna and Simeon in the temple a week later knew. There were people who knew. The wise men knew. Elizabeth knew. And friend, if you don't know, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm talking about if you don't know him as your personal Savior, you can know him too. And if you don't know him, don't claim ignorance and say that one day I'll... I'll just die and I'll go off into oblivion and everything will be okay. Even if there is a God, it'll be okay because I didn't know. Ignorance is not innocence. Well, I, I think this innkeeper could have known if he'd wanted to know. <laughs> really. But not only ignorance, but then indifference. Indifference. Here's an innkeeper who saw a woman who had just traveled about 90 miles. She had come from Nazareth. I've been to Nazareth, and I've been down that, uh, I've been down that way to Jerusalem and, and uh, over towards uh, uh, Bethlehem, and it's a hilly, rugged, torturous terrain. And here's a woman who is, who is great with child, about to be delivered. And do you know that the, we talk about the miracle of Christmas and the miracle of the virgin birth. You know, in her case, it was probably a miracle that she even made it from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Amen. I mean, that's a pretty rough trip. We rode a bus. And I was kind of uncomfortable in the bus riding that 90 miles. But what about a woman riding a donkey? who is about to deliver a baby. Indifference. I mean, she gets there and he shuttles her off to a cow stall. That's pretty uncaring. You say, well, but there, there wasn't a room. So that excuses the innkeeper. There was no room. <laughs> yes, there was a room. His room. <laughs> like the guy that went to, went to the hotel and went in there one night and <clears throat> he asked for a room and the, and the hotel manager said, we don't have any rooms left. He said, now surely you've got one room that you can let me stay in. The man said, no, we don't have a room. He said, now look, if you wanted to give me a room, you could give me a room. The man said, I don't have a room, sir. He said, well, let me ask you this. If the President of the United States showed up here at this desk and asked for a room, would you find a room for him? He said, well, yes. He said, well, he's not coming, so I want that room. <laughs> yeah, he could have given him his own room. So then there's ignorance and indifference and maybe thirdly, involvement. Maybe this innkeeper was just busy. I mean, here's a time when people are coming from all over the country uh, to Bethlehem to be enrolled in that list of taxpayers. <laughs> It was uh, Herod care. <laughs> and uh, there's no room. And uh, maybe the innkeeper's just busy. And he just doesn't have time. You know what? That's exactly what I'm trying to say about our day and time. We may get too busy. With everything that's going on around Christmas time, we are busy. I mean, we're planning meals. And we've got company coming, and we've got family coming, and, and we've got to rush around and do this and do that. And really, if we're, say we're celebrating Christmas, is it a good thing? Is it a good thing to not have time to think on Jesus? Isn't this what we say we're doing? We're celebrating 
the birthday of Jesus? And if we get too involved and shut him out? I mean, look, we're talking about people missing church so they can celebrate Christmas. We're talking about people stealing their tithes and offerings so they can buy presents to celebrate Jesus' birth. We're talking about people having parties and, and, and get-togethers and they can't come to church and they can't go uh, soul winning. They can't take time to read the Christmas story to their children because after all, man, we don't have time. We're too involved. That may be the key phrase. We're too involved. John R. Rice pointed out that they didn't have any room for the Lord Jesus down through the ages. He said they always begrudged Jesus everything. In Bethlehem they begrudged him a place to be born and he was born in a cattle stall. King Herod begrudged him his kingly title out of fear and jealousy and wanted to slay him. At Nazareth they begrudged him the honor and the fame that was due him and said he's a carpenter's son. The Pharisees begrudged him his power and said why he cast out devils by Beelzebub. He's the prince of devils. Then begrudged, they begrudged him the authority of his father's house and asked, by what authority do you do these things? They begrudged him the Sabbath day over which he was the Lord of Sabbath and criticized him for healing on the Sabbath. They begrudged him every feast that he, that they, that he had attended and they said, ha, huh, he's a wine-bibber and a glutton. They begrudged the Lord Jesus of the alabaster box of ointment that was broken and with it which his head was anointed and said, why didn't we give this money to the poor? They even begrudged him that hour of prayer of agony in the garden of Gethsemane and broke in with staves and clubs and swords and took him away. They begrudged the Lord Jesus even of his rightful title, the name, the king of the Jews and said, take it down off the cross. We don't like it. They even begrudged him the clothes that he wore and stripped him naked before he was crucified and gambled for his garments. They begrudged him a drink of water when he was on the cross and said, I thirst. And they gave him vinegar and gall to drink. When he died in agony and gave up the spirit, they even begrudged his body that cried out for rest and relief by stabbing him in the side with a spear. They begrudged him the testimony that his dead body would have and said, take his body down off the cross before the Sabbath. They even begrudged him of his own tomb, laid him in the tomb of someone else. Jesus hasn't had it going very good for him all down through time. He's been begrudged of everything. Now let me give you number two, the second thing. There's no room for Jesus in the world today. There was no room for him in that first Christmas. No room for him in the end, but I submit to you that there's not much room for him today either. In this day and time, for example, there's no room for Jesus in our government. It was prophesied in Psalm 2, verses 2 and 3. Listen to this. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That means against God's Christ child. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Did you hear that? That's what this world is crying out today. We don't want the Christians. We don't want the Bible. We don't want God telling us what we can do and what we can't do. Let's break their bands off of us. We'll be free and we'll do as we please. We don't need anybody to tell us right from wrong. We can decide that on our own. And now, we see that culture has really done a great job of deciding what's right and wrong. Homosexuality has been declared an acceptable, no, not only acceptable, a desired lifestyle. And you must accept it or you're a homophobe and you're a hater. And now, and I knew this was going to happen, our, our culture is so great at coming up with its own morals. And now I said when they, when they legalize homosexual marriage, the polygamists will be standing in line for their turn. 
And just this past week, dear friends, a judge in Utah overturned a law that's been on the books since 1890-something, I believe, and said, in light of recent determinations, we can no longer deny polygamists. I mean, if it's all right for people to be married because they love each other, then uh, why can't a man have five wives? And next in line will be the pedophiles. And psychologists are already saying, this is not a mental illness, and this is not a perversion, this is a, an alternate lifestyle. Men are really good with coming up with moral rules, aren't they? When they, listen friend, when they throw this out the window, there are no absolutes. Either the Bible is true and God is right and every man is a liar or we'll never have absolute truth. Never. And yet, in the name of freedom, our country and our culture and our social system says we'll cast off their bands. We don't need no stinking Bible. We don't need no preacher. We don't need no church. We can make up our own rules. We know right from wrong. We've come a long way, baby, but not in the right direction. The government of Jesus' day, under King Herod, had no place for Jesus. The Jews of that day said, we have no king but Caesar. There's not much room in government. There's not much room in religion for the Lord Jesus. This country, and I don't care who says otherwise, they can be blind if they want to, but I'll tell you the truth, friend. This country was not founded as a secular country. This country was founded on the Judeo-Christian ethic. And the, the historians can rewrite it and revise history all they want to, and they're doing it. You read the history books in the government public school system and you'll see that the historians have written uh, our forefathers they're continually bombarding our forefathers to make them look like racist bigoted homophobic uh, what's the other word I'm looking for uh, womanizers our founding fathers were nothing but frivolous guys who were fortune seekers they weren't really Christians at all and they say, well, they were deists. They weren't Christians. You have a hard time finding a deist among the founding fathers. And if you did, he had a great deal of respect for the people who were Christians. Our nation was founded. And don't let anybody hogwash you or, or uh, brainwash you into thinking that our country was not founded on the Christian ethic. It was. And it's true. You go back. I've got some old history books that were written a century ago. You go back and read them, and you'll find out what history really was before the revisionists got a hold of our textbooks, friend. You better read what those kids are studying in school. It will surprise you, and it will disgust you. There's not much room in America for Jesus. Not much room in our government for the Lord Jesus. There's room for evolution but not much room for Jesus. There's plenty of room for Bible criticism on the TV, but not much room for Jesus. There's plenty of time on TV for Christmas stories that tell you the essence of Christmas is to just love one another or to worship a man in a red suit with white whiskers. But you don't see much on TV. There's not much room for Jesus in Christmas. I'm just being honest with you. I'm telling you the state of affairs. The president, before long, will give you the State of the Union. You better listen to this one instead. There's plenty of room in government for New Age ideas, but not much room for Jesus. It was predicted that in the last days there would be scoffers. and there, It was predicted in the last days that there would be such times as this. There's rooms in the schools for condoms, but not for Christ. There's room in government for plenty of talk about the Muslim faith and even in the schools making room for the Muslims but not much room for the Christian who believes in the Christ of Christmas Mount Soledad, Soledad Cross Memorial in San Diego, California dedicated to veterans 
as a war memorial. And that cross has been out there off and on. Uh, it's been revamped a time or two maybe, but since 1913. A cross out there to overlook a memorial dedicated to the ones who have defended our country. But those people who died for our country cannot have that cross any longer. A judge in California has said it's coming down. And we're done hearing about it. And it's going to be torn down and taken out like garbage. You see, there's plenty of room for the ACLU and there's plenty of room for those who disagree with the Bible, but there's not much room for Jesus. For fear that you'll think I'm <laughs> dwelling too much on current events, and yet if we don't kind of relate to the current events, we tend to not see the relevance of Scripture and what's going on and what's been prophesied. I've never been a Duck Dynasty fan. I just... You know, something about old leftover hippies from the 60s with long whiskers just never appealed to me for very much, you know. But can I just tell you something? Phil Robertson did name the name of Christ, and he did say he believed the Bible, and he did say that he believed the Bible included in a list of other sinners that homosexuals are named as those who would not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible said that. Phil Robertson repeated it. And he's rewarded for his belief by taking him off the TV. <laughs> Indefinitely. I'd say there's not much room for Jesus on TV. And there's not much room for Jesus in government. And there's not much room for Jesus in religion. Nativity scenes and Christmas carols that mention the name of Jesus are being slammed out of the public school system and out of the public square and out of courthouses across the nation. There's not much room for Jesus. Even the little innocent baby crash nativity scene. As innocent as that looks, they don't even want to tolerate that because that indicates that there was a Savior who grew up and died an awful agonizing death on the cross of Calvary. You say, well, why would they care about that? Because that indicates that they're sinners and they need a savior. Amen. And they won't tolerate that. And even in religion, many professors and pastors, probably this morning, standing behind the pulpit are saying, well, now the virgin birth is just kind of a fable that's been stretched a little bit. And, uh, you know, Mary was not really a virgin. That just sounds good in the story. Any man who would stand in a pulpit and say such nonsense as that ought to be run off by his church. Anybody that goes to a church like that that can't get enough to run him off ought to leave and go somewhere else. You say, but my grandmother's buried in the graveyard out back. Dig her up and move her. <laughs> you know what will happen this Christmas? You know what will happen this Christmas? Instead of being room for Jesus, you know what's going to happen in a lot of places? There's going to be office parties where the jugs are broken out and they're going to be drinking and hooting and having a big old time, boy. But it's not, there's not room. You walk in there with a Bible and start reading the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2 and boy, I bet you could hear a pin drop and it won't be long till you'll drop. They'll put you out. Because there's not much room for Jesus. People don't much want this anymore. And people don't much want Bible preaching anymore. And people don't much want a church that focuses on the Word of God. If you entertain them, okay, but you better not put too much in there that's going to make them feel uncomfortable or you'll be like Phil Robertson and you'll be gone. That's the climate we live in. There's not much room for Jesus. There's people who will go to parties and will dance around, maybe even dance around a, a manger scene, and, and there's people who will have Christmas parties, maybe even in a Christian atmosphere, and they'll all sing away in a manger, around a manger, and then the very next week they'll go to some drunken New Year's Eve party and get people who maybe wouldn't even normally drink will go there and drink. Friend, if you do that, you're denying Jesus and you're pushing him out of your life. Putting liquor back in his place, immorality back in his place. There's people that'll 
get excited a little bit about the baby, but they don't want to hear much more than that about it. Now here's the point. This brings me to the third and last point. Those of you who name the name of Jesus, some are listening on the internet, maybe on recording. Here's the point. Number three, we ought to make room for Jesus in Christmas this year. This year. I mean, if you feel like something's missing in Christmas, it probably is. And it may be Jesus that's missing. I remember as a teenager, and I say this with shame and grief and regret, but as a teenager I remember being hoodwinked into thinking Christmas was just a big old time to party. And I remember driving with some other young guys, driving in a vehicle, going, we lived in a dry county, and I remember driving 50 miles to go get booze and get drunk because we were celebrating Christmas. Celebrating Christmas? Celebrating Christmas? No, we weren't celebrating Christ at all. We were celebrating a good time away from Christ. I mean, that would have crashed the whole party. And any place, friend, can I just tell you that any place you go for entertainment, if Jesus would not be welcome sitting right smack dab beside of you, you ought to get out of that place. Get out of there. We ought to make room for Jesus in Christmas this year. Three factors I want to give you about that and we'll be done. First factor is what we want to call the fellowship factor. Hebrews 13, verse number 12. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Listen to this. Listen to it. Look up here. Suffered without the gate. That means outside the gate. Jesus suffered without the gate. He went outside the city to be crucified. You know what? Here, here's the point of that. If you fellowship with Jesus, you're usually going to be outside of the mainstream. Are you listening to me? Young people, listen to me. If you go where the crowd is, you're probably going to be in a place where Jesus is not welcome. You're going to be in a smaller group. Listen, you're going to be in a smaller group when you're in the group that accepts Jesus. Jesus had to go outside the main city. He had, I've been there in Jerusalem, and, uh, and I've been to the, to the place where they call the place of the skull, Calvary. There by a bus station. Hey, listen, it's not some glorious little beautiful green rolling hill out in the country that's picturesque. It's an old barren hillside with rocks jutting out of the face of it. And you know what it was in the day that Jesus was crucified? It was a dump. It was a place of refuse. It's a, it was a place of death. It was not a beautiful place. It was a dark, dingy, stinking execution ground. And that's what it was. You want me to tell you where to find Jesus? Outside the camp. Young people, listen to me just a moment. Look up here. I want every boy and girl to look at me, especially the, I might influence them. I don't know if I can change any of the older folks or not. The temptation is going to be stronger on you than it was your parents and grandparents to find a church where entertainment is the big thing. And it'll have the, the place to go is a place that has the biggest crowd. You know what I told my son Aaron uh, yesterday? We we're talking about churches who are now becoming franchised churches. Now relax, I'm not going to call any of them's name. <laughs> I might in the future, but I'm not today. <laughs> it's like a McDonald's franchise or a Subway franchise, you get linked up with the big church that has the big TV screen, that has the, 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 uh, the great preacher who is, well, he doesn't preach, he gives talks. He gives talks. That's what they call them, talks. 
and you go to that place and there will be a big crowd and they sway to the latest kind of music, man. They have a good time. They're, they even, some of them even have mosh pits, man. And if you get in one of those churches, you're with the crowd, the in crowd. You can be cool and you can even drink. Some of them have beer uh, brewing lessons in their church house and, and wine making lessons. And man, they're the latest and the craziest fads, man. You're in there. You can be cool. Jesus wasn't cool. Jesus was crucified. And while, boys and girls, listen to me. While you may think that going to the place where the biggest crowd is is the best place to be because they must be right. Can I tell you what the big crowd said the day Jesus was crucified? The biggest crowd said, crucify him. The big crowd's not always right. Never has been. Jesus had to go without the camp. Outside. And you'll have to go outside if you're going to be with him. You know, Christmas time is lonely for some people. I was thinking about Miss Pat Brown this morning. Brother Brown was one of the evangelists we supported. Brother Brown, I've known him for 35 to 40 years. One of the first independent Baptist preachers I ever met was Brother Brown. I'm surprised I even got to be a Baptist after I met him. <laughs> I love Brother Brown. And somehow it just still just doesn't seem right that he's gone. He died a couple of weeks ago. And, it, and, and I, I missed him as soon as I heard the news. I thought, and, and, and my son Aaron said, Dad, it just doesn't seem right. Brother, it's not going to be right with Brother Brown not around. And it's not easy to comprehend. But what if you were Mrs. Brown? Miss Pat Brown's facing the very first Christmas without her husband in over 40 years. We got some dear widow women here like Mrs. Crockett have Christmas without their husband and several of you others, ladies. And Christmas can be a very lonely time. It can be lonely for teenagers. It can be lonely for kids. It can be lonely for single people. It can be lonely for about anybody. There's three basic emotional needs that everybody has. Number one, everybody needs to be loved and everybody needs to love. You need to have somebody to love and somebody who will love you back. Secondly, everybody needs to be needed and wanted. Everybody wants to feel necessary. And everybody wants to have somebody they can go to. Somebody that understands them. You ever hear anybody say that? Maybe you've said it. I just wish somebody could understand me. And everybody needs that. Here's what I'm telling you. If you want to put Christ back in Christmas this year, you've got the one that the Bible says is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's the one who will love you when nobody else will love you. Are you listening to me, boys and girls? The time will come when you may feel lonely. Jesus is the one who will always be there. It says he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He'll always love you. In fact, the Bible says a friend loveth at all times. Now, some friends won't, but Jesus will. He's always be your friend. He'll always love you, and you can love him back. Your love is never wasted on Jesus. He'll always understand you. The Bible says also in Hebrews that, he's a, that we don't have a high priest that, that can't comprehend or, or understand or, or, or grasp our feelings. He knows how we feel. And he knows that we need him and he needs us. You say, now wait a minute, preacher, I agreed with everything you said except when you said he needs us. Jesus is perfect. He doesn't need anybody. Why do you think he went to the cross? <laughs> you think if he didn't love us and want us and need us that he would have gone to the cross? <laughs> he needs you. Now he'll get along without you, but he needs you. And he wants you. There are probably people listening to my voice right now who do not know him as Savior. 
listen, real quiet. You don't know him as Savior. You believe that he exists. You may even believe that he died on the cross for your sins and still be lost. So what is believing on Christ? It's more than just believing on him historically. Believing on Christ is when you say, I agree with God. I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And when you say, Dear Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I love you. I believe you've paid for my sins and I accept the payments you made for me. Here's my soul. I'm taking you as my Savior. When you take him as your Savior, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, listen to this. The Romans says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Did you hear that? It doesn't say you have to beg him and, and go through a matter of days or weeks or years trying to become a Christian. You call on him, ask him to save you, and he'll do it right then. That's what he wants. And if you're not saved, you ought to do that this morning so you'll have Christ in your Christmas. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the pianist is coming. While nobody's looking around, I want you to think real close with me, okay? Put everything else out of your mind. Think with me just a moment. The Bible says that we ought to examine ourselves. We ought to see if we're in Christ. If you've never consciously Ask Christ to be your Savior. By coming to Him in repentance and faith, then you ought to do it this morning. Listen. Listen carefully. You come to Him in repentance and faith. Repentance means that you change your mind and you agree with God that sin's just as bad as He says it is in the Bible. It's your dirty, rotten sins that caused Him to have to die on the cross. It's your sins. And you need a Savior who will forgive your sins. That baby in the cradle can't save you. The one who died on the cross can. If you leave him in the cradle, there's no hope. But if you let him be the Jesus who also went on to be crucified on the cross and raised from the dead, then you can be saved. You come to him and say, Lord, I'm willing to turn my back on my sin and I accept what you did for me on the cross. By faith, I believe you'll save me. You say, well, I've done that a hundred times. That's not salvation, friend. If you've asked him a hundred times, why are you still asking him? Do you not trust him? If you ask him once in faith, he saves you. And to keep on asking him shows that you haven't had faith. You need to ask him once for all forever and put your faith in him. Get up off your, you, you kneel at this altar and say, Lord, I'm accepting you as my Savior right now. And if I go to hell, it'll be your fault. I'm not suggested being disrespectful. I'm just saying that's the way it works. You place your soul in his hands. And you get up off your knees and you go ahead about your life and expect fully that you're going to go to heaven because you've done what he said. You don't have to ask him every day and over and over again to get saved. When you get saved, it's called the new birth. How many times do you have to get born physically? One time. How many times do you have to be born spiritually? One time. You can do it this morning. Father, I pray that in this prayer time that if there's people under the sound of my voice right now, dear Lord you know my heart, I want, I want to do my job of letting people know that there is a Savior who will save them and Lord I pray that right now everyone who can hear these words would act upon it those who are not saved would say right now in their heart, right now Lord I pray that they'd say dear Jesus I'm a sinner and I believe you died to pay for my sins and I accept what you did, 100%. I'm trusting you. Would you just ask him, friend, if you're of that frame of mind right now, God won't save you against your will. But if you're willing to ask him right now, he would save you. I'm going to finish our prayer in just a moment. But our heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed. How many of you would pray that prayer with me right now? Would you just lift your hand and say, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to save me right now. Would you? Or maybe you already have. Would you lift your hand? Anybody? All right. Father, I pray that those who are not saved would trust you as Savior. And Father, for those who are saved and have been 
busy about Christmas but have left out Christ, I pray they'd find time for their Bible, find, find time for prayer, find time for giving gifts to the Lord Jesus and not just gifts to men. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to put Christ first, not only in Christmas, but in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand please as the pianist plays? I'm asking you to just step out and come forward. I'll meet you right here. We can pray together. If you're not saved, you can be saved this morning. Would you? Would you come right now? Maybe you've been trusting your baptism or your church membership. You think, well, I'm saved. I got baptized. You can go in a baptistry, a dry center, and come out on the other side, a wet center. There is no guarantee of any salvation in that water. There is a guarantee of salvation in the blood. Jesus shed his precious blood to save you from your sins. And if you haven't trusted in that blood, in that blood alone, there is no remission of sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Why don't you just step out? The devil will tell you, don't do it. You're okay. You've got religion. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says if you haven't believed on Christ as your Savior, you're condemned already. What a tragedy. I don't know if that innkeeper ever got saved or not. He was ignorant of Christ, who he was, 